We've been going through quite a long series, building the case for who Jesus Christ is. We have found that He's sufficient to rule as King. We have found that He's perfect in all of His ways. We've seen that He fulfills everything that was promised about one that would come to be the Deliverer, all the way from the Old Testament. And not only that, but He's much more than just Savior. He's very much Savior, and for that we say praise God, Amen. But He's also King. And He also has the right to rule. And the promise in the Old Testament is of a kingdom. I think something that's interesting for us to look at, and we are actually going to, not today, so don't worry, walk through chapters 12 and 13 verse by verse. Not today. Okay? I know what some of you are thinking. I ain't got that long. I got to go to work tomorrow, right? But we're going to work through this verse by verse. Because in 12 and 13 stand some of the most pivotal things that ever happened during Jesus' earthly life. And one of the most important things that we need to recognize is what in the world was he dealing with in the religious climate of the first century? What did it look like? I mean, we know they were Jews. We know that he told them to take the gospel of the kingdom to the Jews. But he also had a lot of opposition. And the people that he had the greatest opposition from were the people who were the most educated about the Old Testament. So I think what happens in chapter 12, we're going to look at verses 1 through 8 today. If you have a break between 7 and 8 with a chapter heading, go home and get you some white out. Just go ahead and white that out there. Because it really affects the way that you think about it. And as we read through, you'll see the natural break in the narrative that happens. But what we get here is a taste of what he was dealing with as far as what religious leaders, respected individuals had to say about him, his ministry, his disciples, all of these things. So let's read through these eight verses. We'll back up to verse 1 and we'll check it out. Chapter 12, verse 1. At that time... Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath, and his disciples became hungry and began to pick the heads of grain and eat. But when the Pharisees saw this, they said to him, Look, your disciples do what is not lawful to do on a Sabbath. But he said to them, Have you not read what David did when he became hungry, he and his companions? How he entered the house of God, and they ate the consecrated bread, which was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those with him, but for the priests alone? Or have you not read in the law that on the Sabbath, the priests in the temple break the Sabbath and are innocent? But I say to you that something greater than the temple is here. But if you had known what this means, I desire compassion and not a sacrifice, you would not have condemned the innocent. For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Does everybody see how that's a natural break? When you look over at verse 9, departing from there, he went into their synagogue. Everybody see how that's a natural break? Yeah, the whiteout thing makes a lot more sense. I'm not joking about that. I white white out those headings all the time because it causes a mental break in my study. and I, I don't like that at all. Jesus is walking through a field. His disciples are with him. And his disciples are hungry. And so they feed themselves. Anybody see anything wrong yet? It's not their field. Anybody got that going on? You guys are selfish. But no, I mean, think about it. He's walking through. And the first thing that comes to the forefront by them feeding themselves is a religious opinion. Now, I use that word religious on purpose. And that's what we're going to talk about today. In fact, did anybody see the title of today's sermon? Religion, Legalism, and Hermeneutics. We just can't get away from it, can we? We just, I can't. Thanks, Vern. I said, we can't get away from it. Vern said, you can't. 
Don't feel bad because after September 10th, you won't either. It's a good thing. Anybody had a religious person come up and tell you where you're wrong? Anybody notice they're really good at that? Oh, they're real good at that. Here's where you don't measure up as an individual. Here's where you fall short in God's eyes. Don't you love it when people speak for God and then you look at your Bible and you go, huh? Anybody ever seen Scooby-Doo episode when somebody tells them something confusing? <laughs> That's kind of what I think of in those situations. And you sit there and you go, what are you talking about? And here's the reason why is because you find a lot of times that religion ends up being something completely different than what a relationship with Jesus looks like. In fact, it's almost completely separate to where it becomes unidentifiable with what Jesus really thought, promoted, and held to. Now, we're going to do a lot of flipping around today. If you have someone next to you that needs some help moving around in their Bible, that's great. If you wouldn't mind, help them. But also, we're going to have it up on the screen so you can read too. I encourage you not to cheat. Get familiar with where they are in the Word, right? But let's take a look. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the when? What do we know from all of our Sunday school, VBS, WANA training, whatever it is, what do we know about the Sabbath? It was the first metal band from the 70s. No, not that Sabbath. Not that Sabbath. Different Sabbath. You're not supposed to work on the Sabbath. In fact, in Exodus 20, whenever God gives the Ten Words or the Ten Commandments as they're known of, He spends more time unfolding the Sabbath than He does anything else. Now what's interesting is, is you find that in the church dispensation, nine of the Ten Commandments have been repeated except for one. Anybody want to guess what that one is? It's about the Sabbath. Now we're not in the church dispensation yet as far as the timeline of where we're reading, but... It's mindful that if the Sabbath is what they're talking about, the Sabbath is when they're traveling, and the Sabbath is when his disciples are picking heads of grain and eating it, why would they be called unlawful? Why do the Pharisees come in and say, no, no, no? Because that's what religious people love to do. What are the disciples doing wrong? Anybody know? They're what? They're working, are they? Take your Bible, if you want, put your notes here. Take your Bible and turn with me to Deuteronomy. Chapter 23, we're going to look at one verse back here. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, praise the Lord. Would it be helpful if we go through the books of the Bible and memorize them together? I know all the Awana crew already has them because they have a song. Maybe we could get Laverne and Cheryl to do a song. I have a feeling we'd have a hoedown and need a washboard player and a jug. I'm not for sure, but it'd be good, right? You guys work on that. I'd be interested in hearing it. Can you do that? Will you guys? Awesome. They, we have a commitment from them. They're going to write a song to help us with the books of the Bible. If this ain't ministry, I don't know what is. Awesome. So chapter 23 of Deuteronomy. And Deuteronomy is known as the layman's version of the law. Uh, if the law in Exodus and Leviticus was a little bit too technical to understand, this is Moses before he passes away laying it out in plain and simple terms so that there's no confusion about what's going on. So notice chapter 23, look at the very last verse, 25. When you enter your neighbor's standing grain, does that sound familiar? Okay. Then you may pluck the heads with your hand. Does that sound familiar? But... You shall not wield a sickle in your neighbor's standing grain. It's there to satisfy the momentary need, but you're not to fill up your, your uh, Aldi sacks and take it home. Everybody see that? There's none left over to go into storage. It's not my neighbor's field. is everybody's field. It's not that. It is satisfy the moment. Did they break the law? Uh-oh. So how can the Pharisees, who know the Old Testament inside and out, say, what you're doing is not lawful, and accuse them? 
They're saying you're guilty of law breaking. What happens when you break the law today? Arrest them, throw them in jail. What happens when you broke the law back then? Sometimes some things merited the death penalty. This is a serious accusation. And yet we go back to the Old Testament, we go, wait a second, it's right here in black and white. I see they haven't done anything wrong. Why would the Pharisees say this is not lawful? Anybody know who the Pharisees are? They're teachers, religiously respected leaders of that time. If you want, you can turn back to Matthew 12. I want to show you that, and if you want to write it in, you can. I actually don't have any more Grace Bible Church pens. I know, I know. It's a travesty. All right, let's go on. Back to this. Who are the Pharisees? The Pharisees actually came from a group of people known as the Hasidim. I hope I'm saying that correctly. But what these were is whenever they saw the culture in the second century B.C. starting to go more liberal, people were walking away from the law of God, nobody was really worshiping him or following him anymore, and that happens in that period between the Old and the New Testament, there were a group of guys known as the Hasidim who said, no, we have to remain devout to God's law, we have to remain committed, we are encouraging you, go for holiness at all costs. Now that doesn't sound like a bad thing, does it? Are you sure? I'm not getting much agreement there. For the Jew in the second century, does that sound like a bad thing? Okay, let me rephrase the question. Is there anything wrong with when your world is going to hell in a handbasket for a preacher of righteousness to stand up stand up, and say, this is wrong, everybody get right? Okay, good. Same thing, all three questions, okay? This is the idea. These were guys who were pointing in the way of rightness. Now, the problem was, and we talked about the whole Maccabean revolt, right? We talked about how they raised up the priests and they were taken back over the temple and the whole thing like that. When that happened, they participated in that, and then they had a schism that happened. One group became the Essenes. Are you familiar with the Essenes from some of your reading? And they ended up kind of getting out on an island by themselves, not literally, but figuratively, and kind of separating themselves. But then the Pharisees came in, and they began to rise to prominence, so much so that they became part of the Supreme Court of the Jews known as the Sanhedrin. Now these guys began to become very meticulous because when the priesthood couldn't be trusted anymore for religious guidance, which is the very movement that they came out of, People started looking to scribes at that time who were interpreting the Old Testament and giving their interpretations, and we talked a little bit about this because it was known as the Talmud, okay? People started trusting the interpretations of the people over the Word of God. See, Jesus' whole problem that he's dealing with with the religious climate here is nobody wanted to get to the Bible, Nobody wanted to get to what the scripture actually said. Everybody wanted to talk about how do I control other people in order to get them going where I think they need to be so that we have holiness and righteousness. So let's slap a lot of rules and laws on them and we'll make it happen. Maybe they felt that the law wasn't demanding enough. Anybody read the law? There's 613 of them. Sounds pretty thorough to me, right? We got to have more. So let's cover it up. Let's cover it up. Let's cover it up. So the Pharisees are the religious men of their days. Let me give you a definition of religion. It's in your notes. I'll just give it to you real quick. Religion is a set of beliefs or practices by which one gains acceptance with a deity. How can I be right with God? That's the idea. If the creator of all things is who we worship, how can I be in a proper relationship with him? Now, we know that the answer is what? Belief in Christ. It is by faith alone, in the person of Jesus Christ alone, that someone is saved and that relationship is firmly established. It cannot be lost. Eternal life is forever. But that's not what these guys were playing. Religion always tells you, do more, do more, do more. In fact, if you want to spell religion, you spell it like this, D-O. That's all it is. Do this, do this, do this, do this, and maybe you'll be okay. And maybe you'll make it. But if you don't, well, you're unacceptable. 
Well, you may have never really been saved in the first place, or some people want to get real technical and throw it out. You're anathema. Anybody know what the word anathema means? Cursed. You are a cursed person. Anybody in here cursed? Doesn't sound like fun, does it? Ah, we were cursed. We've been relieved of that curse. We still have the effects of it on us, but praise God for Jesus giving us new life, right? So now, you've got these Pharisees. They are religious, slapping requirements on people. Did they know Deuteronomy 23, 25? They did, but the problem is it was buried under this guy and this guy and this guy and this guy. And what they said, expounding off of Deuteronomy 23, 25, was adding a lot of layers and garbage in order to influence the thinking away from right living. It now became expected living. You should live up to my standards. I'm going to try that on some of you this week, see how that goes. Think that'll work? No, it won't, not at all. Guilt is a poor, poor motivator. Not only were they religious, but they were also, here's a fun word, legalists. Anybody know what a legalist is? It's very close to religious, being, being religious or a religion. Anybody know what a legalist is? Abiding by the letter of the law and not by the spirit of the law. That's extremely close. That's extremely close. I've got this definition in your notes too, but I'll go ahead and read it for you. This is actually from Charles Ryrie. A fleshly attitude which conforms to a code for the purpose of exalting self. That's what it's about. It's about you need to do this and you need to do this and you need to do this. Well, why do I need to do this? Because I said so. A lot of times we parent in legalism, don't we? Do we not? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I see all the kids have got this like, <laughs> he's getting my mom and dad. I love it. <laughs> if this is what he does all the time. I'm not going to children's church, right? <laughs> Sometimes we're guilty of that. We see that. Not only were the Pharisees religious, they were legalists. Good grief, it's just getting worse. They were also 34% owner in the Chicago Bears. <laughs> How's that one grab you, Pastor Steve? That's not in the text, so can't trust it. But the Pharisees with their religious and legalistic accusations want to come in and try to shut down something as simple as feeding yourself when you are hungry. Starve to obey starve to be accepted. It doesn't resonate with us, does it? There's everything about that when we think through it, it's, it's just wrong. Now here's what I love. Jesus doesn't take flack from no one. I love it. Notice what he says. Verse 3. But he said to them, now if you have your pen, click it now. Okay? because it will be on fire after you do this. Have you not read? Stop for a second. Who's talking? Who's he talking to? Pharisees. The, did the Pharisees know the Old Testament? They are supposed to, exactly. They were supposed to. But notice what Jesus is doing. Notice he doesn't draw them to any kind of scribes' teaching. Have you not read about the historical account when David did this? Had they read that? How many times do you think they read that? Numerous, right? They were devout. They didn't have Dr. Phil distracting them back in those days. They were all over that scripture. They knew it inside and out. And here's the amazing thing. As well as they knew it, they missed something. Have you not read? That's an insult, well, of course we've read Jesus. What in the world are you talking about? Are you sure? Because everything you're concluding about the guys that I hang with, Scripture tells me different. Everybody see why this is a hermeneutical problem? It's an interpretation problem. I'm going to get every one of you in this class. <laughs> or I'm going to die trying, I'm telling you. Well, then there'll be nobody to teach it, so commit now, right? Have you not read? 
Don't you remember? No, let's look at what he's talking about. Have you not read example number one that he gives that day, what David did when he became hungry, he and his companions, how he entered the house of God and they ate the consecrated bread, the 12 loaves. It's known as the show bread, the bread of presence. Each loaf represented a tribe of Israel and it was to be there inside the holy place right before the curtain of the holy holies. It was part of the consecrated worship of God. Only priests went in there. Yet when David was hungry and he was on the run from Saul, who was the current king of Israel at that time, and he was in sin because he wanted to kill David. He wanted him dead. David is now on the run and he's starving. He asks the priest and the priest goes and gets him the bread and feeds him. Him and his men. Now here's what's amazing. Look what it says. How he entered the house of God. They ate the consecrated bread, which was not lawful. There's Jesus' opinion about it. What they did was not lawful. What is Jesus telling you? They broke the law, didn't they? They broke the law of God. If you want to talk about what's really breaking the law, let's talk about where this bread is not for anyone but the priests. Let's talk about what Scripture clearly says in Leviticus. Let's deal with the actual letter of the law. But notice, it's not lawful that he ate. Look what it says after that. For him to eat, nor those who are with him, but for the priests alone. Does anybody know of any instance in Scripture where David or his companions were condemned for this act by the Father, Son, or anybody else? There is not one place in Scripture where David is condemned for this action. And yet, Jesus declares it unlawful. How do we deal with that? Hold on to that. We'll look at it in a moment. Here's example number two. I love it. Jesus couldn't just let one example suffice. He wanted to stick it to him again. Double punch, right? It's called the double tap. Bam, bam. Anybody seen that movie? Zombieland? Double tap. Got to hit them twice in the head. Make sure they're down. Nobody? Don't watch it. It's gross. Moving on. (laughs) Our pastor is a pagan. No, I'm not. (laughs) Verse 5. Or, have you not read? Insult number 2, right? Or have you not read? In the law, we specialize in the law, Jesus. That's what we're holding your guys against. Mm, Let's see what's going on. That on the Sabbath, so now we've got a relationship as far as the day that is considered sacred. It's not that they're picking the heads of grain necessarily. It's the fact that the day is set apart. It's holy. You're not supposed to work. Your guys are working. What's wrong with them? Okay, so let's use a day example. Let's talk about feeding yourself when you need it, example number one. And number two, let's talk about the day of the Sabbath, how you should conduct yourself on it. Watch this. On the Sabbath, the priests in the temple... What's the word? Break. Does anybody have a little number next to that word break and probably a reference over to the margin? Anybody have that? What's it say? Profane. Man, that's a good word. Profane. How was your day at school today, honey? It was profane. How was work? Profane. You see what I'm saying? Man, there's a lot of power behind that besides break. But notice... The law was profane. It was tarnished in some way. Look what it says. They break the Sabbath and are innocent. Stop. Do you realize what he just told you? He told you that the people that were specially selected and set apart in order to offer sacrifices on behalf of the people who needed atonement for their sins and the priests also needed atonement for their sins have gone to the length of breaking the Sabbath themselves in what they do. All the priests are lawbreakers. Jesus' opinion isn't very encouraging right now at this moment. Because he's just disqualified David and his companions. It was all unlawful. Notice he doesn't condemn them. But what they did was wrong. If we want to hold to the letter of the law. And notice the next part with the priests. We got the Sabbath. On the Sabbath they break it. Let's see this. Everybody put your hand out or notes back here. And turn to Numbers 28. 
Those are the pages that still stick together. That's how you know where that's at in your Bible, right? That's fun. Need to rustle this up and crinkle them up. Numbers 28. Is that right? Numbers 28? Yeah, Numbers 28. Numbers 28. Numbers 28, we're going to start in verse 9. We're going to see something very interesting. You're going to need your pen on this one too for what we're going to look at. Numbers 28, 9 and 10, look what it says. Then on the, what's the day? On the Sabbath day, notice that. Two male lambs, one year old without defect, and two tenths of an ephah of fine flour mixed with oil as a grain offering and its drink offering. And look at this next part, verse 10. This is the burnt offering. Stop. Does anybody remember anything about the burnt offering? The burnt offering was offered by Noah. It's the first instance we get of it when he comes off of the ark. And when he came off of the ark, the reason why he took the extra animals is because they all placed their hands on their heads and they confessed their sins as a means of transference of sin. We are saying we are relieving the sin and then we are killing this animal. And not only did they kill it, but then they skinned it and then they put it on a rotisserie deal and they cooked it at that time, in Noah's time. They cooked it from morning until evening. The priests are commanded in numbers to do this burnt offering sacrifice every Sabbath. What was a priest doing every Sabbath? Watching it. Working a whole lot. So everybody see Jesus' point here. On the Sabbath, the priests who are administering the duties handed to them are actually breaking the Sabbath Command because they're doing works because sin necessitates their involvement. Everybody see that? Notice what it says in verse 10 here. This is the burnt offering of every Sabbath. In addition to, wait, there's more. In addition to the continual burnt offering and its drink offering. This is something that was already added on to the responsibilities that they had. Now back to Matthew 12. So when we read here Jesus' point that he's bringing up, verse 5, have you not read in the law? On the Sabbath day, the priests in the temple break. They profane the Sabbath and are, here's here's the rendering judgment, they're what? They're innocent, they're blameless. They are breaking, profaning the law of God, and yet they are without guilt does that make sense it doesn't totally make sense to me at first look but then jesus gives us a little something moving on watch what he says here in verse six notice he says but i say to you now if you pause for just one second if you've read the sermon on the mount at all matthew 5 6 and 7 you're familiar with this it has been said this 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 But I say to you, now why is this important? Because Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, is taking a step forward and asserting his authority and rendering a judgment in a situation. Is he savior? Yes. Is he king? Yes. Guys, Revelation chapter 1 is really clear about how he's dressed. He's also judge. He's also the judge. Now watch this. I say to you, that something greater than the temple is here. Now let's stop for a second before we deal with this. Here is the problem with the Pharisees' religion and legalism. Trivia question, you ready? I don't know if this is something we flash up before church starts, but here's a trivia question for you. Was the law ever given is a way to establish a relationship with Yahweh. No. In fact, how are people saved in the Old Testament? 
by faith alone. Alone. And when you break down the word alone, it means alone. <laughs> by itself. Nothing else added or it ceases to be what it is. Does that make sense? So anytime we're trying to tack law keeping onto this belief in what God has said, we have destroyed and nullified the whole idea of what saves you. Does that make sense? This is why we have got to come to the conclusion of what dirty, rotten sinners we truly are and our absolute helplessness when coming to the Savior and trusting Him alone. Not trusting anything I'm bringing. Him alone. The relationship with God in the Old Testament is established the same way it is now. Faith. That's it. So why keep the law? What was the law about? Establishing what? Anybody know? Everybody's scared to say it. How many people don't have a clue what in the world I'm talking about? Anybody? Okay, Laverne. That's great. That's great. We'll set up a meeting this week. Hermeneutics. We'll, we'll start you early. The law was what it was to have intimacy with God. God is not content having a people like this. He is not content. It was really hard to prepare this sermon this week. That was your pastor emeritus back there. He is still pretty sure. Harpies all over me. <laughs> see, this is just Sunday. You don't see what happens Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. <laughs> Might be some of the reasons why I had such a hard time preparing this sermon. <laughs> I don't know. But here's the thing. God is not content with people being at arm's length. He didn't bring us into a relationship with him in order to sit. In fact, aren't we told in the book of James, draw near to God and he will what? Oh, we know that and how badly he wants to be there. How badly he wants us to draw near to him and to experience fellowship with him. Why do we do 1 John 1, 9? Because the crud of this world convinces us that our ways of handling things are better than God's ways clearly given in the word and we sin and create a disruption in the fellowship experience with him. And so that sin has to be confessed and out of the way so that the path is clear to reestablish the fellowship intimacy with him. God desires fellowship with us. He wants us on a much deeper level than a lot of times what we give him. Which makes me wonder, and you can't help but to draw this conclusion if you're thinking about where the Pharisees were in this. Are we guilty of maybe sometime religious adherence? Or inflecting our legalism, if not on our own lives, on other people, in order to keep us from the intimacy that God wants to have with us, clearly embedded in his word? Let me say it a different way. Do you run the risk of coming and playing church rather than being the church? Do you run the risk of going to church rather than embracing the gracious gift of being a child of God when we deserved exile. You see what I'm saying? The Pharisees had one major thing going on. They were real good at being fake. They were real good. And everybody looked to them for guidance. And they put laws, burdens, things on them that they wouldn't even do themselves. But it was just about controlling everyone. That's what a religion does. It controls everyone. The problem, with, you, we know the, the phrase Judaism, right, is a religion. The way that Judaism came about was for some reason they threw away this whole faith in God thing that establishes relationship, and they said, no, in order for you to have a relationship with God, you've got to keep the law. And if you don't keep the law, you don't have a relationship with him. 
When the law was about, here's how you have fellowship, intimacy, and blessing in a union with me, in constant communion with me. That's what it was with Israel. It was never about, here's how you're accepted before God. It was because you are accepted by God, by faith alone, here's how you live with God. Big difference. Big difference. This is why we have this big problem now when we see unholiness in the church. And so everybody's conclusion was, well, let's just take the grounds of salvation and let's strap a lot of requirements on it and it'll be okay. It's not. Because it's not the gospel anymore. It ceases to be the very thing that saves people. Did those people have good intentions? Yeah. You know what they created? A religion. They put forward legalism as a means of, of acceptance. Guys, just because we're reading first century Pharisees doing whack things doesn't mean that the whackness is not going on right now. Mitch, throw the quote up real quick. Real good guy, William McDonald, has a really good commentary on the whole Bible. This is a great quote. My wife tells me for good public speaking, I'm not supposed to read from the screen. I love you. I'm going to go ahead. I'm sorry, man. There is a look of derision on her face. The legalists are still with us. What else shall we call those professed ministers of Christ who teach, for instance, that confirmation, baptism, or church membership are necessary for salvation? That the law is the believer's rule of life. That we are saved by faith, but kept by works. What is it but Judaism brought over into Christianity when we are asked to accept a humanly ordained priesthood with its distinctive clothing, buildings patterned after the temple, with their carved altars and elaborate rituals, and a church calendar with its Lenten season, its feasts, and its fasts. That's legalism. And I'm going to tell you something. All of it was done in with good intentions, and none of it has anything to do with a greater acceptance with Jesus. Because you can't be more accepted than you are by faith. You are fully accepted. You are fully adopted. You are fully cleansed. You are in Christ. Now what does it mean when he says there's something greater than the temple? Is the quote still up? Look at some of this stuff. Now go back to the quote. Don't get all antsy fingers back there. Notice what it is. Confirmation, baptism, church membership. That the believer's rule of life is the law. You're saved by faith, but you better do some works in order to keep it. Everybody see the weight? Because this doesn't sound like somebody sat there and said, my burden is easy and my yoke is light. Come to me, all of you who are weary and heavy laden. It doesn't sound like that at all, does it? These are a lot of requirements. Here's the reason why. is because everybody wants to see the visual signs of religiousness. Are you doing it? Are, oh my, you're really growing. Whoa, well you conformed your whole life to that. That's great. Wow, look at you. Is that how God changes people? No. God never starts from the outside and changes them in. He always starts where the Holy Spirit dwells on the inside, and as you feed the Word of God to the fire of the Holy Spirit, you are transformed inside to the out. You can have peace, patience, joy, love, kindness, goodness, something, something, self-control. I can't remember them all right now off the top of my head. You can have all of those things going on, the fruit of the Spirit in your life, and not one person will be able to see it inside of you. If you choose to manifest it outwardly, praise God. But don't let anyone stand in judgment of your salvation and tell you what Christ did was not enough and you need to do your part. Jesus' whole point here, there's something greater than the temple. Was it easy to worship the temple? Weren't the disciples even enamored with this? Matthew 24, Lord, look at how great the temple is. Yeah, it's good. Let me tell you how it's all going to come down. I love Jesus' response there. Because we get so caught up in stuff. When I visited Kiev, Ukraine, and we went into some of these churches over there, and they have all these catacombs where all of these dead people 
are lying on these tables and people are weeping and going to kiss the glass that encases them and rubbing their crosses. And some guy is walking around with this massive gold cross on and would put some wrappers to shame. It's incredible. I actually have a picture on my computer of an entire merchandise counter and it's nothing but gold and silver crosses and emblems and all this stuff. And that is the essence of their religion. And I fear for them they do not have a relationship with Christ and while they weep over some rotting carcass behind a glass thinking that for some reason they kiss it, they'll be forgiven or absolved of their sins, and all this other crap that they have to do in order to gain some sort of acceptance because some guy with a pointy hat who probably has a pointy head underneath it decided that he was going to tell them that's how you can know God? Does everybody see how sick and twisted that is? Does everybody see how far Satan's hand has gotten into what is often esteemed as Christianity? It has nothing to do with Jesus. It's easy to worship the temple. What the Pharisees were missing was that the king is standing in their midst. That's what they missed. Now, how do we resolve this problem? David not accused? We've got Levitical priests breaking the law? How do we resolve this? Look at verse 7. And here is where the knife gets twisted. Because this shows you the hermeneutical problem. In fact, if you want to write that, get your, get your pen out. H-E-R-M, anudical, okay? <clears throat> but if you had known, watch this. But if you had known what this means. Notice, if you would have had the right interpretation. Look what it says. I desire, what is it? Compassion, the word means mercy. I desire mercy and not a sacrifice. You would not have condemned the what? The innocent, the guiltless. The disciple. Here's what he's telling them. My disciples are innocent. But because you know the Bible, but you have not interpreted it correctly, you have turned around and taken a bunch of innocent people and condemned them. And notice how he adds the little seal at the end of this. Everybody see this? Verse 8. For, here's an explanation. The Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Don't tell Jesus how to work the Sabbath. He's the one who set it apart. He's the one who rested on that day. But notice this. Everybody, don't, don't miss this, please. The religiousness, the legalism, the binding, the strapping down, the weighing heavy on people of all that they must do to be accepted to where they could barely walk. You know what a lot of people do in that situation? They drop it all and they say, forget it. I don't want anything to do with it. It's not even worth my time. And sadly, that's what repulses a lot of people, especially young people, from the church. Because it is really easy for the church to move to religion and legalism rather than mercy for people. Do you realize that the Pharisees just accused God of breaking the law? That sounds insane, doesn't it? It sounds absolutely insane. But this is how knowledgeable they were. When God appeared, we called him a sinner. Everybody see see how twisted that can get? Let's pray. Father, I pray that you would search our hearts at this moment. Help us to think through. Maybe we fall into these traps where we condemn people. Try to tell them what they need to do to be accepted before God. Even that we look differently upon them because there is clearly something different about them. 
Maybe they've been led astray in whatever lifestyle they're in. Maybe they've just been raised that way. Maybe they bought into a lie. Maybe they don't know you at all. Or maybe there's someone who has been pushing their whole life towards trying to gain acceptance with you. Regardless, both people need to hear the truth. And Father, may we be convicted of the truth. May we never bring something to people, trying to convict them, trying to condemn them, trying to tell them how guilty they are, apart from the fact of just sin. Keeping the gospel clear has everything to do with this. Because it's real easy to muddle. It's real easy to add. It's real easy to say what we think is right and can be completely wrong. Father, help us to think differently and help us to see the example of Jesus. That we are to be a people of mercy. That we are to be a merciful people. And this is to be a merciful center. That we are to love people to life in Christ. Believer or unbeliever, it does not matter. It does not change. The means does not change. The goal does not change. Religion will destroy us as a church. But fostering a relationship with you will grow us. Thank you, Father, for the clarity of your word on this issue. It's in Jesus' name we pray it. Amen.